Good morning and welcome to Woodland Bible Church, uh, March 29th, 2020. We're getting ready to do our second virtual uh, sermon, so hope you, you uh, will sit back and enjoy and it will challenge you today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you and praise you for the privilege you've given me once again to open your word and expound upon the truths that are there. Father, I pray that today you would uh, speak to our hearts, convict us, challenge us, equip us, Lord, to be the servants that you want us to be. And God, we'll be careful to thank you and praise you for all this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I wonder how many of you have heard of the program Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe. It was a Discovery Channel uh, television program that was uh, first aired in November of 2003 and then went for eight seasons, including uh, 169 episodes. In each of these episodes, Mike Rowe, the host, would uh, find himself doing difficult, dirty, messy, disgusting occupational jobs alongside the employer, employees that actually do these types of jobs. Um, it ranged from, these occupations ranged anywhere from being a sewer inspector to a garbage collector to a leech trapper to a maggot farmer and just about everything that you could imagine in between. Now, if there was a dirty, nasty, difficult job to be done, Mike probably tried it in one of those eight seasons uh, during one of his programs. But if you've ever watched any of those episodes, you would probably agree, like I would, that I would not want to be doing any of those jobs. They were just too disgusting, too nasty, too um, out there for me to even be involved in. That's the last thing that I would want to see myself doing as a, as a job or an occupation. Um, it just would not be comfortable doing any of those things. But there are real people that do those jobs each and every day, and they are necessary jobs. But it's just not a job that I would choose for myself. Well, as we continue our study in the series of messages that we've been in called Conversations with Jesus, uh, we've been looking at conversations that Jesus had with specific individuals or even groups of individuals. And each of those conversations that we've looked at over this series, uh, this will be the 13th message in this series, each of those conversations had something to do with faith. Uh, what is faith? How do I get faith? Uh, what can I do to encourage others in their faith? One of those topics was looked at in just about every conversation that we saw in this series. But today... As we approach another conversation, we're going to be looking at a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. A conversation that happened the night before Jesus was to be, uh, or the night of his betrayal, uh, before his crucifixion. Um, this, the, this conversation that Jesus has with his disciples actually involves a dirty job. What some people would consider a dirty job. Uh, now maybe it wasn't as nasty and disgusting as some of the jobs that Mike Rowe did, but clearly it was not something that most people would look forward to doing. Yet, Jesus did this with his disciples, and he even encouraged us to do the same thing to one another. So if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn to John chapter 13. And as you're turning there this morning, um, let me give you a little bit of background to what John's doing here. John, John's gospel was written for a specific purpose. He had a specific purpose in mind when he was writing this gospel. And he tells us what that purpose is in John chapter 20. In John 20, verses 30 and 31, John says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So with that purpose in mind, John wrote his gospel in a specific way. In the first half of this book, the first 12 chapters, John is dealing with Jesus and his ministry upon this earth. And specifically in that, those 12 chapters, he gives us seven sign miracles. Once again, he did many other sign miracles. But John picks seven of them to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. And then in the last half of the book... It gives us the events that were leading up to and after, right after, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So the first half, the first 12 chapters, gives us three and a half years of Jesus' life. And the second half, which is about nine chapters, John slows down and gives us a whole lot more detail. In fact, in the eight chapters preceding, starting here in chapter 13 and going forward, he covers events that happened within just a few weeks. 
time. So this morning, as we look at this conversation that Jesus had with his disciples, I want us to focus on four things. Four things that we're going to see in this passage, and also along the way, make some application that we can apply in our own lives. So the first thing is this. If you have an outline, I've included an outline, an email that Darla sent out. But if you have an outline, the first thing that we want to see is that what Jesus knew. So in John chapter 13, we're going to begin in verse 1, where John writes, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, And that he had come from God and was going to God. These verses give us some insight into the the mind of Jesus during this time. The the state of mind that he finds himself in. And John is telling us what was behind the motive for Jesus going, what he was going to do with his disciples. And we see several things in here that Jesus knew. First of all, Jesus knew that his time on this earth was short. John says that he knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. He knew exactly what was about to happen in his life. He knew exactly what was going to be transpiring in the next several hours, in the next several days. He knew that he was headed to the cross to suffer and die for the sins of all mankind. Jesus knew that his time upon this earth was drawing to a close. He knew that his time was short. This was the hour that he was sent for the purpose he was sent here to do, to seek and to save that which was lost. He knew this. He was fully aware of everything that was about to happen. And yet, in his final hour with his disciples, he wants to impart upon them a very significant lesson. You know, we also need to realize that our time upon this earth is short. None of us is guaranteed a certain number of days. None of us has the guarantee of life beyond today. None of us knows when our time on this earth will end. All of us know that we have a very short life compared to eternity. And yet, we also should know that the end is near. You know, as as we look around at our society, as we look around at what's going on in our world, we have this reality in front of us that the end is drawing near. That Jesus' return is close. That his coming could happen at any moment. We know that those things are true. And because we know that, it should motivate us to live our lives in a certain way. We should be like the sons of Issachar in chapter 13 of 1 Chronicles to understand the times in which we are living and to know what we are to do in response to that. But secondly, we also find that Jesus not only knew that his time on this earth was short, but he knew what his mission was. John says that Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. Jesus knew his mission. And his mission, like I said before, was to come to seek and to save that which was lost. He knew what his purpose was. He knew what it meant that he was going to the cross to sacrifice his life for all of mankind because of the sins of mankind. And you know, the reality is we also have limited time to do what the Lord has left for us to do. And what is it that he's left for us to do? Namely, the Great Commission. To go into all the world and preach the gospel. To witness to as many people as we can. To share our faith with them so that they might also come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We have a commission that he's given us. We only have one life to live. And only what we do for Christ is going to matter. Knowing that we only have so much time. And knowing that Christ has given us a mission to share him with others. And knowing that if people die without Christ, that they will spend an eternity in torment without him. In a place of torment. Should motivate us to be about doing the mission that God has given us. Being diligent about sharing our faith with others. But thirdly, Jesus also knew that the enemy was at work. John tells us that the devil had already put into Judas's heart to betray him. And then verse 11 in this chapter tells us that Jesus knew who his betrayer was, which is interesting because it didn't change at all how Jesus acted towards Judas. Even knowing what Judas was about to do to betray him, to turn him over to the authorities that would 
start this process of his execution. Jesus knew that, and yet he chose to do the thing that he's going to be doing to Judas as well as to the others. It didn't change what Jesus was going to do. And you know what? We need to also know that we have an enemy. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, to be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Our enemy is alive, and he is doing his best to cause disaster, destruction, and chaos amongst as many people as he can before his time is over. We should know that he's even trying to get us defeated and discouraged. He uses fear and anxiety and stress to get our eyes off the Lord and onto our circumstances, onto our situations that are around us. He's a master at deception, and, and he uses our emotions against us. Therefore, Peter tells us, be sober-minded, be watchful, resist him. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. So Jesus, knowing what he knows, that this is his last dinner with his disciples before his trip to the cross, knowing that he's going to suffer and be crucified for the sins of all mankind, knowing that he needs to fulfill the purpose of God in doing all this, and knowing full well who it was that was going to betray him, that's going to set all this in motion for this night. He also knew that each and every one of his disciples were going to abandon him, that they were going to desert him, they were going to run away from him in his last hour. Knowing all this, Jesus still does something remarkable. The thing that Jesus is about to do shows us the full extent of his love. And that's the second thing I want us to look at. Not, not just what Jesus knew, but what Jesus did. What Jesus did. Look at, with me at verse 4. It says that he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Jesus actually gets up from the meal and becomes a servant to his disciples. And you know, this is the dirty job that I was talking about. Jesus positions himself in the position of a servant and actually gets down on his knees and washes the feet of his disciples. Now, I don't know about you, but I just don't like the idea of somebody coming up to me and washing my feet. Can you imagine a person doing that with you? Can you imagine somebody coming up to you Maybe a stranger, maybe somebody you know, and actually kneeling down and saying, hey, can I clip your toenails? Ooh, gross, disgusting, right? Makes you want to squirm. But the point is, that's how we feel, and I'm sure that's kind of how the disciples felt when Jesus did the same thing. A really dirty, nasty job. But let me give you a little bit of background into what was customary in those days. You know, in, in this culture that Jesus was in, it was uh, the task of the lowest servant to actually wash the dirty feet of the host of the house as well as the guest of the house. Uh, there's evidence that this task was so dirty and so low that not even a Jew was supposed to do it. In fact, uh, history tells us, evidence tells us that only non-Jews, only Gentile slaves were to do this job. It was so low, so disgusting to be... Uh, the person that actually washed the feet of those that were in the house. And there was never an example in all of ancient literature of a superior washing the feet of an inferior. So you can imagine the total shock of the disciples to see Jesus, their teacher, removing his outer garment and beginning to wash the feet of, the, of them. You know, see, Jesus was still wearing his tunic. The tunic was that undershirt, that long undershirt, the same garment that a slave would wear to fix a meal or even to be doing this task of watching, washing feet. And then he takes the towel, and this towel would have been like an apron that he would gird around himself, the, the same apron that a slave would wear. And then he positions himself in the, the situation of a servant to actually begin to wash the disciples' feet. So why did he do this? Well, back in verse 1, John tells us that he loved them to the end. And that, that word end there is the Greek word telos. 
It means conclusion to the full extent, to the uttermost. What it's actually saying is that he showed them the full extent of his love for them. You know, back in chapter 11 that we looked at last week where Jesus went to raise Lazarus from the dead. We didn't actually get to this part in our study last week, but in verse 35, which we've all memorized, the shortest verse in the entire Bible, it says, Jesus wept, right? Well, the verse that immediately follows that, when Jesus was there at the tomb and John records that Jesus wept, that Jesus was actually weeping, verse 36 says this, they said, see how he loved him. What they did was they acquainted Jesus' tears with his love for Lazarus. And it was true. He did love Lazarus. But here we see the full extent of Jesus' love. And that he takes upon himself the role of a servant. He does this dirty job that no one else was willing to do. That is true humility. That is true love in action. So why didn't one of the disciples do this? Well... From Luke's account of this very night, this same meal, we find that the disciples were arguing about who was the greatest. Luke 22, 24 tells us that there was this dispute amongst themselves, even at this meal, about who was the greatest. None of them would have even considered lowering themselves to this position. They were too concerned with who among them would be considered the greatest, that they would never humble themselves to be thought of as less than the greatest. They wanted to be the greatest. They wanted to have that position as the greatest, the most important. They were concerned more with the pecking order than with humbling themselves. You know, and sometimes I think we too can get caught up into that very same thinking. Maybe we would never say it outwardly, but we think it. We think things like, well, I'm I'm not going to do that. That's not my job. Or someone else will make sure that that happens. I I don't have to do that. that. Somebody else will take care of that. I, I, I want to be ministered to. I don't want to have to always be ministering to other people. That's why we pay the pastors and missionaries to do the work of evangelism. That's why we pay them to go out there and witness to people. When we think like that, when, when we are, what we are actually saying is, I'm too great to be doing that. And yet Jesus, the greatest one among them, left his position of authority. He laid aside his power. He humbled himself and he took the form of a servant and he washed their feet. So we've seen what Jesus knew. We've seen what Jesus did. But now I want you to see what Jesus said. Look with me at verse 6. Then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. You know, it's as though... It's as though Peter was watching Jesus draw near to him. And as he makes his way around the table, washing each of the disciples' feet one at a time, he gets to Peter, and Peter does what seems to be the pious or the humble thing. He denies the Lord the opportunity to wash his feet. In essence, he's saying to him, "Uh, do you think you're going to wash my feet? I don't think so. If the disciples thought it was inappropriate for them to wash each other's feet, they certainly thought it was inappropriate for the master to be washing their feet. And so Peter denies him the opportunity to wash his feet. And even Peter could could see that this was inappropriate to be doing by the Savior. And you know, Peter's words appear to be humble. But you know what? The reality is they're very arrogant. They're arrogant. In the first place, Peter is arrogant enough to think that he knows better than Jesus knows about what he's doing. What Jesus thinks is appropriate or not appropriate. He knows that Jesus is deliberately washing the feet of every disciple, and yet Peter is bold enough to correct the Lord as if to say, Lord, you're wrong. You should not be doing that. Not to me. You're not going to do that to me. And he responds to Peter's protest by saying, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm doing right now, but you will understand after this. In other words, Jesus not only indicated that he knew what he was doing, but that what he was doing was right. 
and that Peter would understand this later. But Peter urges him. You know, Jesus is saying, listen, Peter, all you have to do is to trust me, to obey me. And yet there's sometimes I think we find ourselves in that very same situation where Jesus is saying, trust me, I've got a handle on this. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Just continue to obey. And yet, we find ourselves saying, but Lord, you don't understand. I don't think this is the right way you should do this. Lord, is this really the appropriate thing to do? Lord, this isn't making sense to me. Lord, I don't think that this is the best way. I I don't understand what you're doing, and I think that there's a better way to do this. And yet Jesus humbly comes to us and says, just trust me. Trust me, I know what's happening. I know what's going on in your life. I just want you to continue to obey me. That's what Jesus was saying to Peter. Peter, you don't understand this right now, but you will understand this. Not yet, but later you will. And sometimes we have to give God the patience. We have to be patient enough to say, Jesus, I don't understand what you're doing. God, I don't understand why this is happening in my life. God, I don't get why this is going on. God, I don't understand why you've allowed this to happen, but I'm going to trust you and I'm going to obey But Peter becomes emphatic. You shall never wash my feet. In fact, in the Greek, this is a double negative. It's like he's saying, there is no way, not ever, will you wash my feet. He is so sure that he's right. So totally unaware of the pride and the unrighteousness and the ignorance wrapped up in that statement. Oh, isn't there a little bit of Peter in all of us? Isn't there a little bit of Peter in all of us that we think we know what's best? We think we know what's right. And man, if we were just in charge of this, we would do it so totally different. But Jesus responds to his statement with a warning. He says, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. You have no fellowship, no companionship, no sense of my presence in your life. Jesus is not talking about being or the beginning of the Christian life, but of enjoying the Christian life and progressing in the Christian life. He's thus indicating to Peter that there's more to this than meets the eye. You don't understand what I'm doing, but it has a purpose. Hang on, Peter. You'll understand it in a little bit. But that's all that Peter needs to hear because Peter, in his typical fashion, he he swings from one extreme to the other extreme. And this is really just demonstrating the love, I think, that Peter has for his, his Lord. He says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Basically, Lord, if it means I'm going to lose you, I don't care about theological arguments. Go ahead and wash all of me. If that's what it takes to have you in my life, I want all of you. Wash all of me. It's a wonderful response coming thoroughly from a a thoroughly loving heart. It indicates why Jesus always dealt graciously with Peter. You know, a lot of us would give up on Peter. (laughs) A lot of us would hear what Peter says so rashly and uh, abrasively, and we would say, I'm done with him. If he's going to be like that, I'm done with that. But Lord was never like that with Peter. He was always gracious, always loving, always bringing him back because he understood Peter's heart. God sees our hearts. He loves us. He extends grace. And in response, Jesus is going to give us a full explanation. And it's the critical part of this whole passage He's going to give us a a, a two-fold explanation that there are two great truths here. One's a theological truth and one's an intensely practical truth, which are symbolized by what Jesus is doing. And this is what he wanted them to learn. This is what he wants us to learn in all of this. First, there's a, a natural logic to this. Everyone who's taken a bath is clean. But the dirty roads that the people walked upon caused their feet to get dirty because they wore sandals or they went barefoot. And so as they walked along the dirty roads, their feet would get nasty. Their feet would get dirty. You, you've been there. When you walk around uh, without shoes on in the summertime, your feet get dirty. And they need to be cleaned. Now, it doesn't mean your entire body needs to be clean because if you've taken a bath that day, you are clean. But your feet get dirty. And so, naturally, they needed to have their feet clean. It's a beautiful, symbolic teaching. Jesus explains what he means to the disciples with the exception of Judas. He says, you are clean. You are clean. You're clean symbolically because you've trusted me as your Savior. When did that happen? Well, we know from this scripture and other scriptures what Paul calls the washing of regeneration there in Titus chapter 3. He's talking about being born again. He's talking about being renewed by the Spirit. He's talking about becoming a new creature in Christ. 
It's something that only occurs once in your life, not over and over again. It's the beginning of the Christian life. And the disciples, with the exception of Judas, had already experienced it. But Jesus continues, you do need to wash your feet. So what does that symbolize? Well, John tells us in the first chapter of 1 John. 1 John 1.9, he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's, that's the daily walk. That's the daily cleansing that we need. We don't need a new birth again and again, but what we do need is to acknowledge daily our sinfulness, the evil in our lives, and admit it to God. And as we do that, God is faithful and just to forgive those sins and to cleanse us, to wash our feet, so to speak, every day when we do that. It hinges upon our fellowship and our companionship with Jesus. If you want the sense of Jesus going with you throughout all of life, then learn every day to acknowledge your sinfulness and let him cleanse you from that. Let him cleanse your feet. Let him wash your feet every day. That's what Jesus is talking about. This is where the Christian life truly begins to be lived, when you have the presence of Jesus daily with you. And yet this didn't apply to Judas. Judas had never been born again. And though outwardly he was a disciple, inwardly, There hadn't been a change in his life. So that's the theological truth, but there's also a practical truth here. That's the fourth thing we want to see, the example that Jesus sets for us. He knew some things, he did some things, he said some things, but now he's going to share with us an example. Look at verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord and You say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. What we see here is that the Lord taught his disciples by his actions, not just by his words. So often we we say, listen, I want to see that truth in your life, not just hear it. You know, we say, I love you, I love you, I love you. But what we really want is to see that person displaying love in their life by their actions, not just by their words. And so Jesus taught not just with his words to his disciples, he taught them with his actions. And this was so different than the way the Pharisees behaved. In fact, turn back in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus tells us the actions of the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 1, it says, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to the disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to do, observe. That observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge their borders of their garments. They love the best places at the feast and the best seats in the synagogues. Greetings in the marketplaces. And to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi, but you Do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. What he's saying there is the Pharisees behave in a certain way. The Pharisees tell you what to do and tell you what to observe, and you should do that. But don't do what they do because they say it and they don't do it. Jesus says, I'm not going to just tell you, I'm going to show you. So Jesus has washed their feet, and he's done this with his disciples very purposefully. It was a task that needed to be done, and our Lord did it. It was also a way that Jesus could demonstrate his unfathomable love for his disciples. But beyond this, it was a lesson. A lesson for his disciples that they desperately needed to learn, and that it's a lesson in humility. Jesus employs this greater, lesser logic here. He is the sovereign God, the supreme leader. And that's what John was emphasizing to us in the first three verses there in chapter 13. Knowing this, our Lord purposely sets out to wash the feet of his disciples. If he, as the sovereign God, can wash their dirty feet, then surely 
we could do the same for each, each other. Rather than arguing with each other about who is to be the greatest, these disciples should have been humbling themselves by serving one another. You know, the last statement of, that we looked at here in this passage in verse 17, it's profoundly important. Jesus says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not sure if the disciples understood this truth yet, but they were going to grasp this teaching. The important thing is not knowing this truth, but doing it. You know, sometimes I think we get confused. We think the most important thing is what I know. You know, knowing is one thing, but doing what you know is far better. We're not blessed by how much we know. We're blessed by doing what we know applies to far more than just this command here to wash feet and to be a servant. It applies across the entire spectrum of biblical knowledge. It's more important to apply biblical knowledge than it is to gain that knowledge. Some people say, well, I know all about the Bible, and I read the Bible, and I do all the, you know, I, I'm knowing all this stuff about biblical truth and doctrine, and that's great. Knowing it is good, but doing it is so much better. Make sure that we don't just fill our heads with biblical knowledge, but we actually apply that biblical knowledge in our lives in the way that we live our lives. You know, as I come to close this morning, let me just say that it's no surprise to any of us that we're living in very uncertain times. I'll be honest with you, uncertainty scares a lot of people. People are fearful of what the outcome of this whole COVID-19 is going to be, and we're trying our best to adjust our lives to this new normal that we live in. But the truth is, God has not changed. In the midst of all that's going on around us, in the midst of all the uncertainty, in the midst of all the anxiety and all the fear, God has not changed. God still tells us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is there, and God wants us to continue to do what his word has told us to do here. He wants us to continue to be servants to others. To serve others. Not to hide ourselves in isolation. Not to just, you know, protect our own and be fearful of everyone that's walking around us. No, God says, reach out to people. Connect with people. Become servants to all. Blessed are you if you do these things, he says. He wants us to be salt. He wants us to be light. He wants us to show love. And you know what? We have a great opportunity to be vessels of hope in the midst of of this confusing and fearful times that we live in. So I want you to do this. I want you to look for opportunities. Look for ways that you can serve others. Let me just close by, by sharing with you a few scripture passages. I haven't included these in your outline, so you might want to write these down. The first one is found in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, where Paul is writing to these Christians in Philippi. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, he says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. He goes on and says, let each of you look out, not for only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What was the, the mind of Christ? What was the mind of Christ? We saw it today in our passage. Christ humbled himself. He goes on and said, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. And coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. One of the most important things that we can do is to humble ourselves, to sacrifice ourselves, to allow ourselves, to give ourselves to others. The second scripture passage I want us to draw our attention to is in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, where Paul says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We're free. But don't take your freedom and just keep it to yourself. Use that freedom that you have, that liberty that you have to love one another by serving one another. 
And then the last passage is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, where the writer of Hebrews says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let's pray. Father, once again, I thank you and praise you for the privilege that you've given me to open your word and expound upon its truth. God, thank you that Jesus, knowing all these things that were going to happen to him, thought that the most important thing that he could do was teach a lesson to his disciples about servanthood. God, thank you that he did that, that he did that through uh, actions, not just words, but through his actions, he became a servant and washed their feet. And God, he shared with them the most important thing about that was that they daily needed to have his presence in their life by having their self clean from their sinfulness. God, we so need that as well. Help us to realize that daily we need to come to you confessing our sins and once again receiving that intimate relationship with you that we possess as your children. God, I pray that we would also take to heart this example, realizing that maybe it's a dirty job, maybe it's something we would rather not do, or maybe it's towards someone that we're not even sure that they're a Christian. But we need to realize that Jesus did it for Judas, and we should be willing to do it for everyone. God, help us to be servants. Help us to live our lives loving others because you love us. God, we'll be careful to thank you and praise you for all these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.